Actually, let's just get past the standards, nothing to disclose. Okay, what we'll be talking about today is big data research and biomarkers. And I think the best place to start any conversation in this area is really at the end game. And so the question is, what is the end game? The end game, at least what most of us are after, maybe not all, I have a bias because I'm also a child and adolescent psychiatrist, uh, is, is biological tests for psychiatry. We all share this vision of having a day where a child, adolescent, adult, whoever it is, who comes down with a particular set of signs and symptoms that may not be so clear, can go and have some scan or some biological measure that can either help inform diagnosis, help to inform uh, assessments of risk, prognosis, help to guide treatment selections. This is really a guiding vision for at least from a biological psychiatry perspective. Uh, of course, the one caveat also is from a development perspective, we want these tests to actually take into account that the, at the, the child and adolescent brain is developing and changing. And you know, we all have the dream of having these normative assessments. I know this had come up yesterday. Will there ever be a day where you'll be able to sit there and look and say, uh, this is this child's brain maturation pattern. Here, here's where something's going wrong, much akin to what we do with weight, height, and head circumference. Okay, so I'm just going to point attention to these two articles. Uh, the reason I'm pointing attention to one is by NIMH uh, director Tom Insel, which was really a provocative piece that really asked the question of why is it we've been at this for, for decades and why is it that biological psychiatry does not have tests. And I'm going to touch on a few of these points as we go along. And then there's also another one by Javier, Adriano DiMartino and other colleagues uh, recently where we really pulled together our thinking of the last, I guess, five, six years. Uh, stuff that we went back and forth over years in grants and a lot of our guiding thinking to kind of figure out what's going wrong, what's going right, uh, very heavily focused on resting state functional uh, connectomics. Much of what I'm going to talk about today is more general beyond resting state. There will be moments where the resting state minded person may seep through, but I would definitely recommend checking these two papers out. Okay, so one of the first questions really is what is a biomarker? We're always talking about them. And recently when we were working on a paper, I actually sat there and told myself, what the heck is it? What's a working definition? So I went back and, of course, the NIH had something that I thought worked pretty well. So up here we have the definition of biomarker, characteristics subjectively measured, evaluated, indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic process, or pharmacologic response to therapeutic intervention. What does that all mean? What that means that what we're looking for is an indicator of what's going on in the brain, essentially, a particular indicator that we can use to, 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 as a thermometer to figure out uh, what's the status of a particular process or how a particular intervention is impacting a process. When we talk about biomarkers, well, really, we need to, to, to go uh, broad. Obviously, most folks here have an imaging focus. But there are many camps out there, whether it be genetics, whether it be work, folks worrying about protein-protein interactions. It, you know, at this image by Builder and Poldrack I, is one that's always struck me as really beyond showing every kind of ohm you can possibly think of. It's really a unifying construct, and it really kind of forces us to think of the fact that maybe imaging and, and you know, the neural system, um, layer, that's going to work. Maybe it is about the protein layer. Maybe it's more we should be thinking about the cognition. Or maybe it's everything. And once you scope it to everything, this is a massive challenge as far as how to put all the pieces together for the brain. And as I said, you know, so we have a broad risk of candidates. And just once again, drive home usefulness, termination of presence of absence of disease, staging of disease, termination of risk or prognosis, or uh, predicting minor and clinical response. You know, the, the pieces are all there, and the ideas are there. But in the, this is one of the things we keep pushing forward to. But the thing is, what are we actually trying to achieve? So when you're thinking about a biomarker, what should a biomarker actually look like? How do we know when we have one? There are key approach, you know, there are key uh, properties that any viable biomarker has to have. And if you look at any part of medicine, anytime people are using clinical tests, what you're looking for is validity, reliability, sensitivity, specificity. And anytime you go to a doctor's office, that, that, that's what's been established, hopefully, for those tests. One of the other things that folks forget about is widespread availability in ease. And this is going to be a challenge when you look at the developing brain and our reliance on MRI. Because it's not so easy to get that two-year-old or three-year-old or four-year-old to sit still. 
And in that way, maybe in the long run, we'll learn a ton from the MRI and we'll at the same time learn to use modalities like EEG or NEARS, things where we could translate into what can go on in a physician's office. Otherwise, maybe we'll see the development of more uh, motion robust imaging acquisitions or in, in more open mags, this, this is to be seen. But we do need to be thinking about, as we're developing methods and so forth, how easy are they to, to, to apply in clinical practice. Another thing we need to think about, and this uh, comes from Cassian's paper, is how big an effect are we talking about? We, we live in a world where everyone's chasing after P less than 0 0.05. So here is traditional ROC curves, which are used to look at the sensitivity of a measure versus specificity. And you know, what your ideal is, is to be all the way up in the left corner, have maximal area under the curve. That lowest one there has uh, an effect size of 1.5. 1.5 is beyond what most of us hope for in our studies and what we're looking at and what measures we're using. Yet that one there, if I just showed you the 1.5 curve, you'd be like, eh, that's okay. You know, three, effect size of three would be ideal. But we're a long way from even a 1.5. So one thing I want to talk about is the common sources of confusion that, that, that seem to recurrently emerge when it comes to biomarkers. One is that the measure, once again, P less than 0.05, it could be neuroscientifically informative. It might be, able to be something to use to help us identify features that could later be used by something else in some combination to get a biomarker. But it, it, you should not sit there and say, I got a group difference at P less than 0.05, I have a biomarker that's going to have clinical utility. And I've seen this lots of times where people go around bragging about it. And you sit there and think, where would you draw the line between those two scatter plots to possibly have this being cl clinically useful? So something we really need to think about. And also, you know, there's a constant conflict going on in the community about what a biomarker is. It's not causal. It could be, but by definition, it, it's, a, it's an association. And also, it, it does not necessarily have to be neuroscientifically meaningful. You can have a marker that indexes a process that comes to have some black box algorithm that no one could possibly understand. On the other hand, it's very nice when they are neuroscientifically informative. Also, sometimes you don't know how you got to a particular biomarker, but you could trace back. But we need, we need to be humble about this. Also, there's no best modality. We all love our modalities, but there's no best. Okay, so how do we know when a biomarker is ready for deployment? I constantly have people coming up to me at conferences and saying, I, in, in 40 subjects, I, I got a great uh, you know, predictor, and I, th I think it's ready for, for clinical utility. And I'm like, 40 subjects? And then the first question you ask is, fine. Forget the sampling biases. Forget the fact that it's, it doesn't make too much sense to change clinical practice on 40 subjects. But what validation approach do you use? And they used to leave one out cross validation. Big mistake. We need to actually realize there's what we do in, when we're trying to establish methods and when we don't have data, and then what we do in, in the ideal world. In the ideal world, it's supposed to be independent replication samples. And you'd like to think a lot of what's done is going to eventually one day be tested with independent replication samples before actually being put into practice. And adequate sample sizes are crucial. We're constantly looking at situations where someone takes one underpowered sample that, that they match to get a finding out of, and someone else takes another underpowered sample and doesn't replicate, or says, I found something else different. And you watch two underpowered studies fight with each other, both for it with false positives and negatives, and you're just like, ah. And also keep in mind, that replication sample, if the design is not appropriate, if confounds aren't handled, then you're still going to be confounded. As far as, actually, how are we doing time-wise, Hagar? Okay, so I wanted an upcoming speaker to put lots of pressure on me to not go over at all costs. And I, I will not mess with her in any way. Uh, so diagnostic biomarkers. Uh, how close are we? So this is one of the questions that uh, about a year and change ago with the ADHD 200 consortium, uh, we had a global competition and invited folks to take the data. You know, we had one labeled set and then we released a small uh, unlabeled test set and ask people to see what they could do with the rest in combination of resting state and uh, T1 images. And what you basically see is it's not the most impressive ROC curve. Now, one thing, of course, that's nice is, well, wrong button, there we go. One thing that's nice is it's not sitting there on this line, which is a complete chance line. Some people did actually do a bit better. But this here, if, if we had X people used to leave one out or one of those other approaches, that would have looked good. But this here is a more sober, honest appraisal of life. And, there's a whole set of, of, of different insights one could get from this competition. Now, it, can we not do better? Yeah, there, there are, the thing is this was about a year and a half, two years ago. I have now seen numerous studies where people are actually pushing that line, uh, uh, their curve away from, from that line. 
and the approaches are getting better. One of the things about this is everyone, most people who tried it just pretty much took whatever can uh, support vector approach that they knew and tossed it at it and thought support vector machines are going to solve everything, not understanding a lot of different thought and consideration and so forth. And you know, and actually in, in uh, Damien Fair, uh, for the ADC Children's Consortium's paper, he actually showed some applications of support vectors that, that did better than what most of this did. And, but that was after a couple years of thoughtful going back and forth and really cleaning things up. And this is a process that keeps happening. And so data sets like the ADC 200 is something where we want to keep iterating over it in order to figure out how do we get the methodologies better. Also, if you want to see a review of uh, prediction efforts in functional connectomics broadly, uh, in the Cassiano's paper, uh, Adriano DiMartino and Cameron Craddock put together a really extensive review of, of the literature showing everyone's prediction accuracies, positive predictive values, and so forth. It's worth checking out. Okay, development status. Well, it, it, when you look at these, it makes you feel a little bit better. Uh, on the left comes from resting state. On the right comes from a structural. Uh, you know, but even here, we have to start thinking about what is the form going to look like. Are we going to see this asymptote? where the brain matures to a certain point and that's our maturation index, or are we gonna see something more linear? And I've seen people get results bouncing back and forth. And you have to be careful too, because there are sampling biases that you could create that could drive your results in different ways. Uh, and also there's lots of room for overfitting and all sorts of things that people come up with. And always look at the validation approach. Okay, so big data. Why is big data ideally suited uh, for biomarker identification? Once again, I'm showing the, the, you know, this diagram which basically says this is a massive complex problem and one that's going to overwhelm us. Well, the idea of big data really is you're going to try to understand a complex system through the application of these data-intensive, data-driven uh, computing methodologies. And you know, what we're talking about is massive data sets. You know, this here does stand in, in, in this causes lots of controversy back and forth. Why? Because what we're talking about now is, is data mining, this discovery science, data-driven approaches all things that, that many of us were taught are evil and, and non-scientific. Uh, at the same time, it, they do have their value for, ironically, hypothesis generation. Uh, lots of times you can take an agnostic approach, look at what you get, and then actually apply your knowledge and existing understanding of the literature to try to piece things together and try to work backwards. And some things are going to prove to just be too complex for us to understand, but still could be true. Uh, you know, it, so the idea of, of, of the discovery science, what you get with big data, isn't necessarily to keep life a big a black box. It's to help inform us for things that we don't already know. And trying to help understand this more, I, I was like thinking of, of AA, <laughs> yeah. Because this argument people are so struggling with, so yes, yeah, serenity, courage, wisdom, you know, it, it, but they, it, it, even though I'm being kind of funny with this, it really is. If, if, if you don't know something, then explore, because just because you don't know if a relationship exists, it may not mean it doesn't. The thing is, you can use a quick data ex exploratory approach, appropriately done, and that may reveal something which may be meaningful for you. Of course, don't sit there and tweak it to cheat, but if you've done it appropriately, you can find things that are meaningful. At the same time, if you have a hypothesis, then go ahead and test it, and don't use a highly exploratory big data framework to test something that you didn't need to because that would just make you look silly. And it's also common that people use an uh, exploratory approach and then they'll see something they recognize and all of a sudden that becomes their hypothesis for the paper. And you look and you think to yourself, why would you have used ICA on this? Why would you have used cluster when, when, when you didn't have to? And this becomes a thing where this is the balancing act that people are going through. But, and we won't go into the noted difference, but definitely do so. Okay, our doc, this emerging agenda where we see uh, this somewhat overwhelming view of, of, of the basis for the future of psychiatry. At first, it could seem very overwhelming, and at the same time, RDoC is really encompassing. If you look at units of analysis, how different is that from the Poldrack and Builder uh, slide I keep showing? Not different at all. If we're going to, I know some people are arguing that what we should do is come up with a great hypothesis driven approach and highly principled analysis to fill, you know, to fill up each and every cell of the many pages of this that, that lives in our docs. Not seeming like it's going to be the most practical thing, but something that we need to think about. This our doc in the way it's laid out is ideally, big data, it is ideally suited for it as far as an approach to help start filling in the grid. With that said, uh, one example which, which I, you know, I like a lot comes from Damien Fair, uh, where Damien basically showed, now I wouldn't call this big data because it was only a few, it was like four or five hundred subjects total. But the thing is, is a demonstration of what you could do with a data-driven approach where I, you know, and Damien can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I don't know if Damien predicted these exact results. 
where he's a data-driven approach and got gorgeous results that really got to force us to rethink, is it really just ADHD versus controls? Or is it that we have these, these different uh, cognitive profiles and then the disorder layers on top in it or somehow interacts? I think this is an excellent demonstration of what can be done with data-driven approaches and how it can help us to overcome some things in order to think in a way differently than we might have been thinking previously. If Damien did have that exact thought, then I apologize. I, I didn't before reading this. Uh, okay, notorious bad practices that we addressed by big data model. Well, first of all, and this goes back to the Kapoor paper uh, with Tom Insel, significance chasing, the, the quest for a .05 with 15 to 30 subjects, not really helping the field. Approximate replications, we all using different data sets, different approaches, don't really do much for replication. Similar is good enough for most, that's not really helping us. And extreme comparisons, healthy versus not. Uh, and and, and the, the, the not is different groups in different studies, not particularly helpful. Big data model where you're creating these massive data sets would be a lot more useful in these ways. When we're talking about big data, you know, I noticed lately all of a sudden 1,000 subjects is viewed as big data. 1,000 subjects is not big data. It's big data for, uh, for those of us in imaging, and it makes us feel really good because we weren't there. Go speak to people in genetics or in you know, electron microscopy, where like microscopy folks laugh at us about the thought of us talking about, oh, we got gigabytes and terabytes of data. They wish they had that problem. Our data sets will explode, and we, especially depending on what, how you do, deal with things analytically and also with the advances in imaging. But the point is, 1,000, we're not there. Okay, we should be talking about tens and hundreds of thousands, really. And if you think about it, if we're going to change clinical care and have clinically applicable procedures, we'd want to know that's really based on solid data sets, not 30, 50 subjects, or even 1,000. Um, another thing is beyond just uh, the, the, the number of samples and data sets, we got to worry about standardization. We need to have standardized measurements. This is a constant thing where folks, everyone feels that they have the best measurement and they're their best protocol, or they don't really know what the best measurement is and just ask the guy next door. As a field, this needs to be worked out. If there's not standardization and measurements in the data, we'll never be speaking the same language. Also, multi getting multiple layers of data, levels of data, not just, okay, I got my imaging data, but you also need your genetics and so forth. Uh, and another thing which I'll touch on a little bit more is the need for quality control. One thing to keep in mind is a lot of big data efforts or connectomics efforts are moving forward. What you see underrepresented here is the development. Most of these efforts are not focusing on development, including the 100,000 subject one coming out of the UK, which is ages 40 to 60. It's going to be an amazing effort over six years, but it's not touching the developing brain. Uh, here's a recent effort that we have at the Nathan Klein Rockland, uh, sorry, Nathan Klein Institute with the NKI Rockland sample, where we have 1,000 subjects from 6 to 85. Uh, and this is something where we took on the challenge of the phenotyping. You can see the full protocol in the Nooner paper. We really tried consulting everyone in different fields and tried to figure out how do we get uh, comparable phenotyping at different ages and so forth. And you know, this is about, a, it takes us two, two days to, to get all this data, and it's overwhelming. But at the same time, if you're looking at this model of RDOX and big data, then, then I think this starts to push more in the way. And the newest versions, after having good input from reviewers, we now also get immu immunologic markers and so forth. One thing to keep in mind is artifacts must be considered. Uh, we all want to sit there and look away at times, and big data is going to make us see them more than ever. And also, we need to kind of act more calmly as a field. Uh, so, you know, when, we, when the newest artifact comes out, it shouldn't be that everyone at NIH in review section starts shooting down grants over, the artif over, over this artifact and that artifact, and, and people just start in reviews putting these things in there without necessarily fully understanding. You know, it, artifacts are a major consideration. In just the last two years, and here's just a small sampling of all the papers coming out, head motion, you couldn't have a bigger issue you have to worry about for development. At the same time, it needs to be taken with some, some sort of pragmatics, and this balance is going to go back and forth for years to come, if I had to guess. Issues like global signal, global connectivity, physiologic signals, these are all, all still in controversy, and it really drives me crazy when at times I see in a review saying, global signal, we, we know that's a dead issue. No, it's not. That dead issue is going to play out and keep playing out. And even if global signal is not right, which I could go back and forth as to whether I, whether I think it's right or not, the thing is, what can we learn from that correction? And what is that correction getting that some people hold on to and others reject? So we need to be learning about the artifacts. We need to understand it. We can't just close our eyes, because with, with larger analyses, you will see more. And final notes I'm going to end on is that the data must be shared. So thousand functional connectomes project in India are things that we've been building for the last four years. 
uh, where we basically have been pulling data from uh, sites around the world in order to bring efforts like the initial Connect Homes project data set or the ADHD 200 or Abide. These are initiatives where we not only pull the data together and carry out analysis to show that there's a value to pulling data together because people used to say that that would never work, but we openly share it and people are taking these publications, uh, sorry, these data and publishing with it. Here's a recent uh, FCP Indie usage survey that was conducted. Uh, and you know, it's interesting, when you look at what people are using it for, 76% publication purposes, master's thesis, 11%, doctoral thesis, 38%. This is really pulling in a much larger community, and the reality is the more we make child and adolescent data sets there, clinically relevant data sets in there, what we do is incentivize a larger community. So my last slide, because I just got done. Uh, with the last slide, keep an eye out for upcoming initiatives from the FCPND in particular, because uh, core. Uh, we've got pledges now for over 12 uh, test retest data sets from over 1,250 subjects. Uh, less than 200 of them are, are from child, child data sets. Uh, as a side note, the NKI Rockland, we just got a award that will start yielding test retest data sets and sharing. But the bottom line is uh, we need data. I mean, if we want folks to be looking and understanding about development effects on test retests, then please contribute data. Just contact me. That one's still going. Uh, we're creating CBER, Collaborate for Brain Imaging and Reading. That one you'll hear about soon, NIDA pre-processed. If you're a NIDA investigator uh, and you have data, please consider sharing it. That's part of a NIDA-funded effort. Uh, and brain simulation projects, we're getting TMS over at the NKI, and so we'll be sharing those data sets as we generate them. And that's it.